cloud. Yep, it's okay. recording now. Uh, <laughs> and we, I'm going to do polling in the end. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of polling here. We can do some poll. I, I like the idea of like interactive. Uh, interactive okay, cool. Polls. So you can think of some polls to throw yeah. out. How do yeah. I see polls? I don't know if I have the ability to make polls though. So we have 64 people in the waiting room. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, I, don't, I think only you can make polls, uh, Anton. It looks like it may only be a host thing. Where, uh, where do you find the poll, uh, Anton? I found it um, next to participants. Yeah, it should, be, it should be in the bottom bar, but I think maybe only host has access to that. Okay, cool. So just send uh, me the poll questions. Since yeah. Like. Also, uh, did you make it that uh, no one else can share screens? What is that? It's a setting when you it's a setting in uh, in the zoom meeting. So no one else can share screens. It should be I think by default. Uh, yeah, I find it only host. I, I put in only host. Okay, only host. Yeah, that's the yeah. That's I the, change it now. It was in the advanced sharing options. Yeah, that that, that kind of stuff is critical. So that we yeah, can, you know, <laughs> <laughs> prevent i attended a thesis defense where that happened wow <laughs> it was bad like they 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 didn't turn off all the settings so people just joined and started sharing screens that were terrible like nsfw things and you can draw on the screen too if you allow certain settings so they just like would draw on the screen of the presenter it was bad <laughs> oh no terrible. okay so i should invite everybody now sure um, but I guess we're going to wait a couple of minutes to get up to 150 at least. Yeah, okay. We can wait till we can wait till we hit like a threshold and then let it in at once. Not like we have to seat them. Uh, so I'm going into uh, yeah. I'm going to go get my computer. Uh, it says that participants are allowed to unmute themselves. So we probably don't want that, do we? Oh, can we uh, allow? Oh, I, I. I just changed it. So. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry, what happened? Uh, uh, there, I found that the, it said participants were allowed to unmute themselves. Oh. oh, we are we are the participants. Oh, okay. Are we are the we, no? But is that everyone or other people can also unmute themselves, but we can also mute people when we let them in. So yeah, so I think it's okay to. Uh, I think we can uh, uncheck that one. We should be able to mute ourselves. Can I mute all? I can mute all. It says mute participants and entry. Allow oh, participants to unmute themselves. No. Yeah, okay. I unchecked that, so I don't think they we want them to, right? That does that no. include the co-host though? But you guys are not muted, so I mean that's good. Okay. Yeah. I think we've done. Uh, I mean, we found so much more uh, with this Zoom bombing, which was. <laughs> so yeah. Let's, yeah. Yeah. Shall we go? Yeah. Let's do this. Sure. sure. Yeah. So now we have someone sharing a screen. Didn't we remove that? Uh, everyone. Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, we had uh, 270 signups and we're currently 82 people in the meeting. So we're waiting for some more people to drop in. We're going to start in a minute or two.
How do I remove video from everyone? Do you mean your video? No, uh, the video. Can a co-host also admit a participant? I think so, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, let's get started. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Anton Tanel, and I'm the Head of Communication and Collaborations for Folding at Home. Uh, with me today, I have some colleagues from Folding at Home, and most importantly, our lead developer, Joseph Coughlin. Um, so let me introduce, so you guys will introduce yourselves. Uh, we have Jürgen Noemi uh, from Business and Emotions, and we have Sukrit Singh from Washington well. University in St. Louis. Joseph. Yes, hi. So I'm Joseph Coughlin. I'm the lead developer at Folding at Home. I started back in 2008. Uh, Initially, I was working on a project with Notre Dame to integrate uh, a new folding core and uh, started seeing the internals of uh, folding at home, which had been a lot of it had been developed at the time by various PhD students and postdocs who had kind of come and gone. And so things had, after you know, running for about eight years at the time, things had gotten a bit messy. So I approached uh, VJ and said, you know, I think I can help you out and. Uh, cleaning up the software, getting in a better condition to last for a longer term and uh, you know, make some improvements. So I'm not sure I fully knew what I was diving into at the moment, but uh, <laughs> you know, all these years later, so it's now uh, 2020, still at it. And uh, I've developed it. So I rewrote a lot of the software, um, which, uh, you know, as a developer, we love to do. <laughs> um, the uh, client and the work server and the assignment server, I guess we're gonna go over um, the structure of Fully Home in a bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, things have been kind of uh, just going business as usual for quite a few years. We've actually had a decrease in usage in the last, I'd say five years or so. And then, you know, recently, um, as of uh, say about the 10th or 11th of this last month, uh, things really exploded and we've had a ton of downloads and uh, I think we've had over a million unique uh, IPs download our client software. It's probably well over that by now. Last time I checked, it was in that range uh, since uh, the beginning of March and uh, our traffic has just exploded. So we've been uh, working pretty frantically to scale everything up and things have held pretty well. You know, we haven't completely fallen apart yet, but there's definitely been a lot of fires to put out. So I've been stomping out fires left and right for the last several weeks and working late hours and keeping it running. So things are going pretty well. Uh, we've still got a lot of work to do and uh, we're excited to have uh, new people jumping on board and, and helping out with the project. There's a lot that can be done and uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, Jürgen, do you want to do a quick introduction of yourself just to people know? Yeah, I work as um, 
uh, at an agency and been a developer in my uh, past career, but now working as a product manager and running the agency. And also in this, I'm the program manager to try to uh, organize stuff and uh, make things happen. And to crit. Hey all, so uh, I am a PhD student in Greg Bowman's lab uh, and I am actually, you know, I'm very much, you know, one of the people that gets to analyze and make sense of the data sets we generate with folding at home that you help us uh, collect. So, and I've been helping, you know, man work servers. I've been with Greg since 2015 now. So this is, it's been, uh, it's been quite the ride and also have been helping with recent explosions helping uh, uh, coordinate some of our outreach and some of our tweets out there. You've seen, uh, I've been helping out with those, so. Great. Um, and what we're doing today is uh, we're having a, a fireside chat, which is more re relaxed. Um, but we will look into what is folding at home and how is it built? Uh, how does the infrastructure look? And uh, then we will take questions. We know a lot of people have questions. And uh, so we're giving good time to get questions from the audience. Uh, please send your questions directly to Jurgen. And uh, then I will read them out. And in the end, we're gonna look at some next steps uh, because we've had a lot of interest from a lot of companies and individuals. And we really want to create a stronger folding at home. So we're gonna look into that and introduce what we're thinking ahead. All right. Joseph, an overview of folding at home, take it away. <laughs> yes, okay, so this is just a really simplified diagram of uh, the folding at home system. And uh, obviously, so the clients that are the, that represent the software that uh, people download from our website and install on Mac, Windows, or Linux. And uh, that connects obviously to our systems over the internet. So they uh, first, when a client starts up, the first thing it does is it contacts the assignment server or AS. So we use a lot of uh, acronyms just to shorten uh, the names, particularly for typing purposes because we communicate a lot through email and uh, other electronic means. So uh, the client first contacts an assignment server and it asks for an assignment and it tells the assignment server what kind of hardware it has available. Does it have you know, how many CPUs, how many GPUs, um, and you know, other parameters such as the, the operating system and, and the assignment server then uh, takes that information and makes, tries to make a good decision on uh, what kind of uh, work that client is going to be able to do effectively, and it uh, makes an assignment. So in that case, it gets assigned to a work server. So a work server, or WS, uh, sits out at uh, one of many different locations around the world. We have, I think, about 27 of them right now, and we're continuing to add them at pretty quick pace lately. Uh, just to expand our uh, capacity. So once the client has the assignment, it goes to the work server and says, okay, this is the work I was assigned. Uh, the work server can verify that it's a valid assignment, not something just made up, uh, that it actually came from the assignment server. And then uh, once it uh, receives that, it uh, hopefully it has the, the work that it, that, that it was assigned and it uh, assigns it to the client. The client will then download this packet of data that we call a work unit or WU. And uh, the client then takes that and starts running the, uh, uh, what's called a core on the work unit. So you can see in the, in the folding at home system, we have cores, which are, cores are simulation cores. They are executables that uh, run this, the, the actual protein folding simulation on the work unit. Our main cores right now, we have two. We have one based on Bromax and another great based on OpenMM. These are uh, both just molecular dynamics simulators. And uh, so the client runs that and that takes you know anywhere from half an hour to, it can even take a day or two sometimes to complete a work unit. 
uh, once it's completed, assuming it was completed successfully, the client will bundle that back up into a results packet, which it sends back to the work server. And in this case, we also have what's called a CS or collection server. In case the work server is not available or the work server is too busy, the client has an alternative place it can go to return its uh, results. So it can send the results and, and get the, and, and move on and, and get another uh, work in it. So if the collection server gets the results, the collection server will forward those results back to the work server uh, when ever the work server becomes available again. So the work server ends up collecting all this data from many different uh, clients and the data is organized into what we call uh, trajectories. So there are several different trajectories of data. Uh, these are, a trajectory is a, is a stream of data that basically requires, once one work unit is completed and returned to the work server, then we generate from that the next step in the trajectory. So that ends up being another work unit that gets assigned. So there is an aspect of, of just serial uh, execution of these simulations. And uh, the, the way we get parallelism is we're running a whole bunch of different trajectories at the same time. And those can operate in parallel on different clients. And then the results are taken as a statistical ensemble of all these different trajectories. So we get a good picture of how the protein is folding and uh, what kind of transitions and, and, and states that it visits along the way. Um, I'm not the best person to ask on the science, uh, about the science questions, but uh, that's my layman's understanding of that. Um, so once that happens and the client is returned, it just goes back to the assignment server again and uh, just keeps doing that, hopefully, you know, night and day, uh, completing work units as fast as it can. And uh, currently, uh, it's hard actually, it's difficult for us to estimate exactly how many clients we have uh, running at any one time. Uh, there are a number of ways to measure that, but IP addresses change. Uh, we actually have the client generate an ID so we can keep track of which client is which and try to count them, but those can also change as well. If people uh, uninstall or wipe out their data and, and start again, they, they get a new ID. So that can sometimes be inflated because there are, I have detected that there are some clients that are doing that on a very regular basis, so they're generating lots of IDs, which kind of throws off our counts. Um, so that can be... Uh, difficult to count. I recently started counting uh, the number of hours of simulation time that are occurring per hour. So hours per hour, that might sound a little confusing, but I think it's a good representation of how many active clients we have. And it's kind of right now sitting between 400 and 600,000 uh, active clients. So this is, this discounts any clients that are failing or are having any problems getting work units or the time the clients are spending not working, that all gets erased. This is kind of a lower bound of where we are at right now. Um, so they, so anyway, so talk a little bit more about this uh, chart here. Um, sorry, let me back that up a second. <laughs> uh, stats, just to cover the last two things on there, stats is our website that shows statistics about um, what's going on with the various uh, teams and users and how many points they've uh, earned and the points earned by month and number of work units completed for teams and users and the web services we have uh, that's just kind of a catch-all for a lot of different little applications that we have that do things like allow people to get pass keys or we have some internal apps that allow us to uh, whitelist the different gpus that we allow uh, we basically just allow the GPUs that uh, work with fully at home and, and block the ones that uh, either fail or are too slow or don't have the features we need. So um, I think that covers the diagram. Yeah, sounds about right. Uh, now that we have Sucrit with us on the call, uh, do you want to talk a bit more about the trajectories and the science you're up for it, Sucrit? Just to give. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, just a just a quick overview. I mean, these trajectories are basically uh, movies 
each trajectory is essentially a movie of the atoms of any of these proteins, most of them at the moment being COVID-19 proteins, moving over the course of time. So we're, you know, watching these atoms, uh, as Richard Feynman puts it, like wiggle and jiggle. And in doing so, they move around and these, these motions have both uh, biochemical meaning in terms of how they act and how they function for the virus to replicate, as well as uh, potentially unearth uh, grooves and pockets on the surfaces of these proteins that allow us to target them with drug design methods. So um, yeah, so I think that's a lot of the, a lot of the general, uh, a general overview of that. That's what these trajectories are and that's kind of what we hope to get out of them for sure. Yeah, great. Um, we're getting a lot of questions and I, I was about uh, to ask you, Joseph, um, so the scaling, the scaling that has happened, uh, the 20 fold, uh, the exaflops coming in and obviously a huge strain on our network uh, and our infrastructure. Could you, um, could you boil down what has been the bottlenecks for, for our project the last, what have we, we been struggling with and, and what has been solved and what, of the, what are the bottlenecks that you're seeing ahead? Uh, like shortly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's always the question with uh, scaling any sort of system or any, any sort of performance uh, uh, computing is that identifying what are the bottlenecks, trying to eliminate those and then move on to the next one. So there's always gonna be another bottleneck uh, under, under whatever one you run into. So one of our major bottlenecks has, it is, and is difficult to um, address, but we are addressing is, is just producing start states for the protein trajectories. So, you know, we can just copy the start states a bunch of times over, but that doesn't make any sense because then we're just, Copies are used. We do use a certain number of copies, and that is to get statistical averages. But there's a point where that has diminishing returns, and we really need new interesting star states, and that requires uh, the researchers to come up with uh, the data to do this. And we are working with uh, a, a lot of different labs. We're bringing on several new labs uh, to help us create new start states. We're working on new methods as well. Um, one of those is called uh, adaptive sampling, where the uh, adaptive sampling is an algorithm that can look at the results of uh, the simulations we've already done and identify new points where that have not been covered well by the existing simulations and generate new start states automatically and uh, start off new full length home trajectories. So that's really a future thing. That's something we've been talking about for many, many years. Uh, it's a bit challenging, but we have a good plan in place for that, something that uh, we're going to be developing over the next few months. Uh, in the short term, you know, we just have had huge demand. We're still not meeting all the demand that we have uh, hitting our servers. The assignment server still uh, sends a lot of client requests away. Uh, the clients do get work eventually, but they have to spend some time asking for work <laughs> before they get it. Uh, that is is uh, improving every day and you know, the numbers are going up. I've got some uh, tracking of uh, how many work units we're actually getting through the system. And uh, right now we're pushing about 85,000 work units through the system per hour. So that is um, work units that actually get assigned, uh, get to the client, uh, get processed and then return and then go back into our database for credit. So there's, more than that occurring, you know, some of them get lost along the way for various reasons. If people shut down the machine or something, you know, goes wrong with the simulation or, or there's various things that can go wrong, especially when you've got this many clients running on all kinds of different setups and platforms, there's plenty of things that go wrong. So there's a certain percentage of loss, uh, but the, you know, 85, um, that, so that's how many we're actually getting through. So, that's one of the big scaling areas. The other is you know, just the work servers themselves. So the assignment server has not proved to be a bottleneck. The amount of data that it transfers is very small. 
and it's had we've got two assignment servers and they've had no trouble keeping up with uh, the traffic they could actually I think handle a lot more uh, the work servers on the other hand are a little trickier because they're actually transferring large chunks of data um, there that's one of my big focuses something I'm looking at is, is uh, improving the speed of the work server uh, I have made some changes to it and, and got more speed out of it uh, in the last few weeks, but I think there's still more room to improve that. Uh, so that's that's one bottleneck, but it's, I think the more importantly is actually the number of start states, because if the work servers were faster, we'd just run out of jobs a lot quicker <laughs> is what would happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, so that's the, the difficulty with increasing the number of start states without having something like adaptive sampling is that we actually have to bring new researchers on for a lot of it because it, the researchers they can only do so much you know each human kind of this the scales uh, linearly when we've had just an exponential growth in a uh, number of clients in the last few weeks so we're still catching up with that but the numbers are going up so um, like i said eighty five thousand work units coming in per hour today but a couple of weeks ago that was uh, 30,000 and before that it was much less. And before this all started, uh, I'm not quite sure what the number was, but it was uh, much, much lower than even 30,000. So uh, we have scaled up a lot and we still have uh, room to scale. I'm not quite sure where the cap is, but I would say that we might be able to do as much as 200,000 uh, work units per hour. Uh, with the demand we have now and but there's still you know there's users uh, Continuing to download the software every time we get a new news article more people jump on board So it's hard to tell where the upper limit is, but we're just scaling we're we're aiming to uh, you know scale as much as we can so Yeah, <laughs> no exactly um we're getting some questions about um, the um, the work servers. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we have increased work servers. We have a lot of partners um, that are helping us spin up more work servers. Could you tell me tell us a bit about? Um, so what are the requirements for a work server? Uh, well, so we've, we've gotten a lot of help with work servers. That's been um, one thing that uh, uh, a lot of industry partners have, have jumped in and offered us uh, work servers and we're uh, scaling that up quite a bit. Uh, the requirements we're looking for right now, uh, I, I'm not sure that we, need more work servers at the moment. We've had lots of offers and all kinds of different levels of offers from people saying I've got a computer, one computer on a fast uh, network to some of the bigger uh, Silicon Valley companies offering us uh, access to cloud computing services. Uh, it, what we're really, what we're running a work server on right now is about 128 gigabytes of RAM and uh, at least a gig e ethernet and uh, you know 32 processors is a good number somewhere in that range or uh, it's not really cpu bound load so the number of cpus is not a huge issue but the thing that really gets everyone everybody who's who's uh, contributed is the major pain point is the data that we need to handle and we're on our work servers we have a minimum of uh, 50 terabytes of storage and uh, obviously in the cloud that's very expensive which is why in the past we haven't uh, done any cloud computing with the uh, work servers because the cost is just too high for data storage uh, it just folding at home generates a lot of data in a hurry and uh, without at least 50 terabytes uh, the servers are full way too soon even with 50 terabytes uh, we're filling those up in a few weeks and we need the researchers have to go in and analyze the data and and uh, which reduces the quantity of the data so you know there's probably also potential to automate some of that um, there's also some things they're working on to automatically strip off the solvents so in the simulation you have 
actual protein molecules, uh, the pro atoms of the protein uh, are floating around there, but there's also a solvent, which is generally water. And so you have all these water molecules, and depending on the type, of, there's two different types of uh, simulation, main types of simulation, implicit solvent and explicit solvent. So we're doing a lot of explicit solvent simulations where that means that the water atoms are actually in the simulation. They're not applied. In implicit solvent, they're just kind of handled statistically. They're not actually uh, modeled directly, but a lot of ours are they're being modeled directly. There are ways you can strip the waters out and save a lot of space data-wise. So we're looking at uh, methods to, to reduce the data. We're also looking at ways to take the data and store it initially in more expensive storage uh, while we need access to it, while the work server needs access to it. And then as soon as it's no longer, uh, if it's in the middle of the trajectory, then you don't really need to look at it anymore. We really only need to, the data from the tip of the trajectory and the very beginning of it, there's some start data. So the stuff in the middle, we could move off to less expensive storage. Um, although, you know, when it comes time to analyze it, we do need to access it fairly quickly for a short period of time. So we're looking at um, all kinds of ways to, to reduce the cost of the data. Um, but uh, yeah, we're getting, the, we're getting plenty of really awesome hardware uh, donated to us. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. Hopefully that continues. You know, when this uh, hype dies down, <laughs> we'll see who's still there and still supporting us. Um, but uh, that's, and we've had a lot of offers of help, so I wouldn't say that we really need people to jump forward and give us more work servers, at least not at the moment. Uh, I hope that answers that. Yeah, that answers the question. Um, what, one more question from Glenn about the work servers. Uh, is writing data to the work servers a big bottleneck? Uh, one of the big bottlenecks is uh, getting the data back from the clients. And uh, the clients, you know, most of these are, are home machines. People are running on, you know, typical subscriber links. And uh, that usually means they're, they're not symmetric, as in they can download very fast, but then they upload often, you know, it can be as a tenth of the speed, their upload speed might be a tenth. So, Receiving the data back from these clients is a lot slower, significantly slower. And uh, that actually ends up being a bottleneck. The way the work server currently uh, operates, it loads the entire work unit into RAM as it's coming back. So that's one of the reasons that we're currently working with 128 gigs of RAM on these machines. Uh, alternatively, we could push the data directly to disk as it's coming in. Uh, that's not how it works now. Uh, the disadvantage of pushing it a disk is then, as soon as it's completed uploading, we're gonna have to read it back and operate it on it to generate the next work unit in the trajectory. So, uh, but it's still, you know, the, one of our limitations is, is RAM because if you have, fifth, if, if each work unit is uh, 50 megabytes and you have a thousand clients, uh, then you're gonna need uh, 50 uh, gigabytes of RAM to to handle those thousand clients downloading or uploading at the same time, and uh, that puts a cap on how on the work server how much traffic it can handle at once. And with these clients uploading very slowly, you know you have more and more and more of them piling on and uploading at a slow rate. So that's one of the improvements that uh, I'm working on with the work server to just be able to not have it be dependent on uh, the, the amount of RAM by pushing data to the disk. Cool. Uh, we have uh, like four questions um, on this topic. And it's, uh, have you looked into a torrent type system uh, to also allow the clients to store parts of the data? Yeah, that's been suggested already. Um, it, it does. The big problem I see with a torrent type system is the reason torrent works so well is because everybody wants the same data. So if you're downloading you know, the latest movie or whatever, everybody's trying to get the same data. And so you can send pieces of the data to 
whoever's sharing the data in the first place, which would be us, we'd be the source in the case, you could send out pieces of this data to different uh, clients and then they can share those pieces amongst themselves. Well, that doesn't work with Foley at Home because we want each client to get a different piece of data, not the same data. So that's just, uh, that. it would be awesome if we could use something like that. It just doesn't work with this uh, setup. Makes sense. Um, compressions of data. We've been talking a lot about data and a lot of data. Uh, <laughs> how are we on compressions of it? So yes, we have we have the option. The work server can compress data. The work server and the cores actually do the compression on the other end if we tell them to. Uh, we have used bzip compression and. and it works, but it just hammers the CPU when it comes back to the work server. Uh, you know, just decompressing and compressing 50 megabyte chunks of data uses a lot of CPU. It, you can do it, but then what happens, the CPU suddenly becomes a bottleneck. Uh, one thing that we haven't fully investigated, but is we do have code in place to, to handle is to use uh, Zlib compression instead. It gets you know 75 to 80 percent as good a compression as uh, BZIP, but it actually operates. The compression is about five to ten times faster. I'm I'm pulling these numbers out of the air, so <laughs> don't quote <laughs> me directly on that. But it's in that ballpark. So we could maybe do compression there. Um, so that would help with uh, with bandwidth definitely, but it's not going to make a huge difference because. This, this data is, is kind of like random data. If you have completely random data, it does not compress well because there's a lot of information in it. And uh, there's a lot of information in the data that we're sending back and forth. But you can compress it to some degree, but you maybe save like 20 to 30% or something like that. It's not gonna be you know, half or a quarter of the size. But even 20 to 30% can be helpful, but it's not a game-changing kind of difference, which is why we've, you know, tested it a bit and, it, you know, when it's hammering the CPU, it's, it, it's not been worth it so far. So we're, we, we're definitely trying those kind of things. Cool. And um, one question from Alexander here. How hard would it be to enable the client to generate the next steps, the next step in the trajectory? Um, actually, yeah, so that is not uh, a big problem because actually they can just continue. <laughs> um, that is something that we have not yet implemented, but is a significant, potentially significant improvement. They still have to upload the results though. So that does save you on downloading. So there is some waste there that you download the next work unit. Um, there are some potential benefits to that and some drawbacks. Um, one of the benefits is if you have a really fast client, then they can complete that trajectory very quickly. And it's, it is an advantage to us to get some trajectories back faster um, and get more information sooner. Uh, the, the downside, one big downside is, is, is you need to, know that that trajectory is still being completed and still being worked on. Otherwise, uh, you could assign it to someone and you think they're working on it. Um, and you, you, need, you need feedback from the client to really know that they're still working on it. Uh, otherwise, the trajectory could just die. You know, so if somebody's, say, you know, working on a trajectory, they're working on it really quickly, and you know, they turn their computer off, and you don't know for a while what's happening with that and you have to time it out and reassign it at some point. So we, it is possible, it's what we call uh, streaming where the client would stream the data back to the work server as it's uh, creating it and just keep continuing on the same trajectory. So that's, that is a very uh, a good idea and something we're looking into, but it, it's gonna require some significant changes to our software because it's just not how fully at home was set up initially and we've uh, we've kind of some of the things that were some of the decisions that were made really early on we've been stuck with because the system is is big and complex and it's a lot of effort to 
change uh, things on several different sides. So we'd have to update the clients and all the work servers to, to be able to support this. Uh, but it's something we plan to do. And we're, we are developing uh, a new client. So there's, there's a new uh, uh, beta of the client that's out there now that's a 7.6. And then we're working on a 8.0 client that uh, is, is, is much different. It doesn't yet have this streaming, but uh, it's possible that we could do streaming with that client down the road. Sounds good. So you're talking about the new client. <laughs> Do you want? Um, we've yeah, we've had a lot of pressure on a new client, and, and you've been actually working on a new client for some time. Do you want to tell us a bit about the client that is currently in beta? Yeah. So there's, I, I guess I kind of covered a second ago, but there's yeah. two new clients. So there's the seven point six, which is currently in beta. And that is just a minor revision of the existing client. Uh, one of the main things we're adding there is the ability to select a COVID-19 disease preference. And there's a few uh, <clears throat> important bug fixes. Uh, for example, uh, some clients uh, get stuck in a loop where their web client just keeps reloading. And that's been extremely frustrating for some users, understandably. Uh, that is fixed in this new beta. Uh, I pushed out a, a release of it yesterday and I've gotten some feedback uh, on that already. I'm going to do a 7.6.1 uh, hopefully today, either today or tomorrow. I think I should be able to get that out and it would be great if the people here are interested in beta testing. I believe Anton's going to set up a um, sign up sheet for that. So yeah. did you also want me to speak about the, the new, new client or? <laughs> I mean, I'm really excited for the new, new client. And I think uh, that's something that we've, you've been working on a long time. Um, yeah, too long. Um, so I've been working on it for off and on for over a year. Um, the thing that's really slowed me up on it is just I have so many other responsibilities at folding at home, you know, keeping the work servers running and the time servers running and all this other stuff and then helping people on board with the software because I have, you know, the clients, most of the, the client software users are there. They get tech support from folding form and GitHub. So, that information gets distilled down by other people before it gets passed off to me. But I have all the work server and assignment server users at these different labs. And so I actually end up spending a lot of time helping them, getting them started, fixing bugs in that software and uh, adding the things that they need. So that continually distracts me from developing uh, the client software. Um, but the new uh, client uh, is functional. Uh, it's not, fully complete. Uh, we plan to make it uh, open source. Uh, so it will be our first uh, fully open source client. And I'm hoping, especially with all the interest that's, that's around now, that other people will actually develop the new client. We'll take uh, off from what I've started with that and, and create uh, a new fully home client. It'd be fantastic to have another team working on this and, and uh, just take that uh, off off my plate, you know, I've been, we didn't have nearly as much interest in folding at home uh, two months ago. So <laughs> it was, this is something we've wanted for a long time. And we've talked to people about doing it, but uh, now seems to be the, the time everybody's uh, excited about folding at home. And it's fantastic. It's been stressful, but it's also exciting. Uh, the, so what's, what's valuable about the new client? Um, one of the big differences with a new client is that it talks to the assignment server and the work server in a different way. It uses a uh, JSON uh, over HTTP API, which is something uh, most developers are pretty familiar with. Whereas the existing client, the, the seven series and all the ones previous use a binary format. They have these binary packets that were designed many, many years ago. This is part of this uh, legacy code that, uh, that I inherited. And it's not ideal. One of the things we've been 
uh, concerned about with it is just it opens up a lot of potential attack vectors. You know, if somebody modifies these binary uh, fields in ways, there's all these different places we have to be careful about how we parse that data and handle that data. Whereas with JSON, it eliminates a significant portion of that. And we still have to obviously be careful about how we handle user data coming in, but uh, it makes a lot easier to be assured that our, our work servers and assignment servers are secure. And uh, so that's why we're comfortable with making the new client uh, open source. And uh, this API, I think, also makes it a lot easier for people to, to develop a client against our APIs, because this is something that's very familiar and industry standard. Uh, I have a document uh, on the API there's uh, a little bit of work that still needs to be done on it. But one thing I learned with this uh, recent influx of traffic is that the, I'm concerned about uh, how the data gets sent back in JSON. Um, I think that we actually want to have the work unit data. It's currently being uh, base64 encoded, but that actually increases the size of the data in the API, so it'll end up being attached as binary data. So it'll be JSON plus a binary blob. So that's one change that we'll be making in the new API. Um, but other than that, it's uh, pretty ready to go. So there's uh, a lot of logic that the client needs to handle correctly, and that is mostly implemented in the new client already, the 8.0 client. Um, but uh, the, one of the big things we're missing on it is uh, the user interface side of it. So uh, the way that the users interact with it. It doesn't currently support FAW control, and it uh, has a very, very minimal web interface on it. So that is something that is pretty critical to getting the new client out and, and, and usable. Um, you can actually, we haven't released it uh, outside of in our internal development, but uh, it, does run and download work units and, and return them. So it, it does the, the practical part, but uh, it's missing the user interface. So that's, and we're really excited to have people help with that. So uh, I think we're gonna give some options of different things people can sign up for that they, to express, tell us what they're interested in. We really yeah. need to, yeah. We, yeah. So that is actually taking us to the, to the next uh, part. Um, how do you get involved? We have some projects. So, um, we're just gonna, Joseph, do you wanna do a, a little breakdown from, start from GitHub um, issues? What are those? Yeah, I'll try to go over this pretty quickly. I see we're running down on time. Um, so, okay, you want me to start from the bottom? Okay, uh, <laughs> GitHub issue triage. That is something that'd be very helpful, um, if, especially for people who are more beginner developers. Uh, we have so many issues on GitHub, and in the last few weeks, the number has just exploded, and I have not had time to dig into them at all. Um, I've just been, I get an email every time they come in, but I've just been putting them into my, archives and planning on going back and looking at it later, but it would be a huge help to have knowledgeable, knowledgeable people go in there and find uh, duplicate issues and eliminate them, find issues that just don't make sense. Sometimes people post a question about how to use their, the software to an issue and that's not really an issue. Um, they need to be sent uh, to folding form or somewhere else to get an answer. Um, and then there's, the issues that there are a lot of people active on and reporting that are really important and we need to have those uh, distilled down and it, basically we need a report of what is the most important stuff so uh, the, the parts that uh, various people are working on we can focus on what's uh, most important. Um, so I think all these items are going to be, we're going to ask everybody to uh, to say what they might be interested in helping with and how many hours a week they may be able to put into it. 
Uh, Anton, I believe, is going to put together a sign-up sheet for that. Um, yep. The Protein Viewer is uh, part of the client. Currently, when you install the client, you get uh, FAW Viewer, and uh, that works pretty well, but uh, there's definitely room for improvement. You know, it's really kind of a cosmetic thing, but it is actually very valuable because when people can see the, the proteins, the actual protein that's on their computer and being simulated, I think it is very encouraging. And, you know, people want to know why they're uh, spending time on this. They want to see a little bit of what's going on. And I think, you know, the visual aspect of the protein viewer is very important in that sense. It doesn't really help the science directly, uh, but it gets people excited, which does help the science. So. Uh, we would be very interested in, in if somebody has the skills for uh, one thing we didn't put on there is uh, we need OpenGL, so 3D graphics experience. Um, the, if somebody's interested in getting into that, either enhancing the current uh, viewer or uh, writing a completely new one, or I have a version of it actually that is a completely web based, web uh, GL based protein viewer. Uh, that uh, I can hand the code off to that if somebody's interested in developing that further. Um, stats, that's a similar thing. You know, it shows what's, you know, how many points people are, are earning. Our stats.foldingathome.org is uh, useful, but it's not terribly exciting. You know, it's just kind of a list of, of the top people. It would be nice to have that look better and uh, show some more interesting information. I actually did start a new system called console, um, but unfortunately when we got hit with all this data, the data collection behind console just completely crapped out <laughs> and I had to shut it off. So we have to revisit that. It's collecting time series data, which is a trickier than correct, uh, collecting totals, which the, currently we just collect totals of the points. We have records of every point that's been entered into the system, individual point records, uh, but tracking that in a database is more difficult. We started doing that and uh, that was fairly new and it wasn't fully mature. And when we got hit suddenly with all this traffic, it just wasn't ready for it. And the first weekend of when we had spike in traffic, I saw it was backlogging majorly, so I just shut it down. But fortunately, we were only in beta with that, so it never uh, really reached the public. But so that had some really good ideas in it uh, for stats. And uh, I'd be willing to definitely, we can share that, show what we've done there, we, the ideas we have about resurrecting that and also just about improving the, the existing stats system. Uh, Project Viewer also uh, uh, in a similar vein, uh, getting people to know what's going on and, and folding at home is a big problem we have. You know, we haven't been able to communicate very clearly about the science, I mean, we can point to all these papers that have been produced on folding at home, but those are pretty hard to parse for the average person. Uh, our project descriptions are a bit of a help. You know, they pop up in the client, they give a little bit of information about the project and who's behind it, why they're doing it. Um, what I would like to see, and we've been talking about for a while, and I think actually there's already some work being done on this, um, but, uh, the, a, a project uh, viewer would be like a sort of carousel view or something on the web where you can look at a project, you can see the, 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 the most active projects on Foley at Home and just kind of flip through them and see pictures. Ideally, we'd also load in a web view of, the, of one snapshot of the protein so people could look at a 3D view of the protein. Um, so there's a lot of potential work there. The client, I think I've pretty much covered that already. We, you know, we develop a new client, we want a new open source version, and we'd love to have people involved with that. And uh, yeah, website enhancement. Um, yeah, our website is pretty good. One of the, but you know, we've had some performance issues. Although it's, I think it's handled the traffic well. Uh, it could be faster. I know that faster you get your website, the better your Google rankings will be. Uh, so that's important. Uh, we're running on WordPress currently. We could potentially move to something else, but we do need the ability for people to edit and enter articles into it. So another big aspect of that is that we have tons and tons of 
of articles and data on that website, and a lot of it is really out of date. Uh, we've got stuff dating back many, many years, just kind of collected and piled up on that website. And what we really need to do is have people who are good at uh, at website design and just organizing of all that information into what is the most important and prune out. I think we could throw out a lot of stuff, stuff that just is irrelevant or um, just plain incorrect. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done there. And uh, gamification, I'll let other people talk about that more, but basically we, that's also about getting people more interested in folding at home by making, making it more fun, basically, to, to compete and be a part of folding at home. So, and yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. And uh, I think that you covered uh, everything. Um, we also have strategic product design. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, with the, when you did the signups, you wrote a bit about your uh, experience and proficiency and uh, we saw that uh, there are some architects and uh, product owners at, with a lot of experience and so uh, going on to the next slide we just wanted to to say that uh, we're looking at slack um, for the work groups um, we're looking at a project structure with 10 members uh, we're looking at a team leader per Per group, of course, uh, we're working with work orders for GitHub, and then we're going to have Slack also to to socialize a bit, so, so you get to know each other. And uh, obviously, we're also looking at like yeah, team talks and sprints. And um, we created a draft for a roadmap. Just to um, we're very glad that we have one and two people on this call and we had 250 people signing up. So there is a lot of interest and we're getting a lot of interest uh, from different companies. And we definitely want to move forward with all the interest that we have today. Uh, so uh, the strategic product design will be um, a group that sets the, the design uh, parallel with this, uh, we're going to have the gamification group um, and we have a project leader from Ubisoft that is going to lead that group. Uh, we're of course inviting uh, companies to contribute with project managers uh, for these parts and this is something that we will continue talking with different partners about. Just to try to do the best with what we're getting and uh, we really value your time this call has been for one hour and we're 100 people for one hour. That's 100 hours. Um, so this is a bit about what we're looking at a project uh, roadmap in a week. And uh, yeah, do you have, should we take in some last questions before we're moving forward to the last slide uh, with the links for the signups? Sure. See. Is there anything, Joseph, that you think like mm, you want to add before taking the last questions? There have been some questions about uh, clients and versions and uh, alternative clients on like uh, gaming consoles and such. What are the uh, um, roadmap for what kind of clients we are going to build in the near? or pretty long future, Joseph, you think? Uh, well, the, the, the short term is obviously just the, the new version of the existing clients. Um, we are looking at uh, building uh, other clients on gaming platforms. Uh, they're, I'm not, we, we have some, uh, we're doing some work with interest street partners and they are very cautious about uh, announcements about what's going on there. So I'm not quite sure what I can yeah. announce at this no. point. <laughs> we can't yeah. announce anything at this point, but we, we are. But it's happening. It's happening. Yeah. That's what I would it's say. Happening. <laughs> so um, 
and then yeah just other than that just the, the clients we discussed so uh, we would eventually we'd like to get on android and there is some work being done to port the client to arm processors which is important to getting onto android um, another key thing that we haven't solved on android is being able to use the gpu because just using the cpu on phones is not terribly attractive these days but the gpus are fairly powerful. They're enough that we could get significant performance out of a phone. Obviously, battery is an issue on phones, but uh, the way we've always envisioned that working, we have had a, a, a phone client in the past. Um, yeah. We want to thank uh, Sony Mobile for the Android client that we had up and running for about two years. Right, so they um, deprecated that a while ago and, and that shut down, that ended. Uh, we would be interested, that was CPU based only though, and yep. we, we would be interested in, in doing that. And the way that would work on a phone is that it would, the default setting would be that it would only run fully at home when you were plugged in and above a certain battery level. So if you plug your phone in to charge, obviously you don't want fully at home starting up and preventing you from charging. <laughs> but if your phone's plugged in and it's fully charged, that's the time when we could utilize the processor and the GPU, and, and you could be folding on your phone, which would be pretty awesome, because there are a lot of phones out there. So uh, that's definitely in our sights. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, do you have anything, any last one, uh, Jorgen? Any questions that we... Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking how we could, uh, I mean, it's good questions here, and I think I would try to collect them, and because we can reach all the people uh, who had signed up, I think, so we could, uh, I could try to go through these and see if we can get the answer for those we haven't answered, and I think uh, most of those questions, or some of them, would be answered when you do the sign up and get involved. Uh, there are some... Um, questions about which, tech, which technology is used in detail and such. Uh, you might find it on the web page if, uh, if it wasn't clear now and Josef discussed. Um, so yeah, uh, I think we're pretty good so people can go on and we, I would try to collect all the questions if we can send out answers in the future. Or possibly we make a, a blog post about it. And yeah, I think that's how we do it. Thank you. And we have a new website. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we get it on the old one. Okay, so uh, one one thing I would say uh, about the technology technology question, um, one thing that's important to us is is open source. You know, even though we've got a lot of closed source, and that has been not by our desire to be closed source, but basically that's mostly been focused around uh, keeping the point system safe and making sure that people can earn points and not cheat. And, uh, but other than that, you know, we're looking to go fully open source in the future. So we definitely want to use uh, open source technology. So we're not really interested in new projects that, or we're less interested, I would say, in new projects that uh, utilize closed source uh, technologies. Uh, I, there, there was a question now that I, th I think is interesting, uh, because we had talked a lot about technology and stuff. Uh, is there need for uh, data analysis, analysis needed, stats, Excel, graph theory and such? Um, and I think with the gamification and the visualization of the different parts, I think that could be interesting. Uh, or what do you think, Anton and Josef? People who can uh, help us take the data and show it in a good way on the website, for example. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's stats is, is uh, one place. Um, yeah, we're definitely open to ideas there. Um, the, yeah, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I'm not a data guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's yes. the simple answer there. Yeah. Um, no, I totally agree. Um, we are three minutes over time. Yep. So I want to thank everybody once again, and I'm going to go to the last slide, and I'm going to send out uh, the link. So we have some next steps for you. If you want to join a work group, then you can click on the link that I sent to everyone. 
we want to invite people to, because we're getting questions in all social media channels. Um, so we are on um, primarily on Twitter. We are on Facebook and we're at sub, uh, we have a subreddit for Folding at Home. And we also have a Folding at Home forum, foldingforum.org. So helping out is also answering questions from other parts of our community that is not as uh, technical and have pretty basic questions. And uh, yeah, so that helps a lot. Anton, you should probably post a link to the forum just to make sure everybody has yeah. that. And if you answer a lot of questions in the forum, you might become a moderator. Um, so that is, no, sorry, I didn't send it to everybody. Mm -hmm. Sent. And so if you want to become a beta tester, um, it's available for download, but we would like to have your, con your email address just to keep you in the loop, right, Joseph? Uh, yeah, so we'll send out uh, a message to people who sign, is that on the sign up uh, for the beta yeah. testing? Okay, so if you are interested in beta testing, let us know and I'll send out a message to the beta testers when I've got this uh, 7.6.1 version out. I've got good feedback from the 6.0, 7.6.0. Um, and I, there's changes I need to make, so we don't really need more input on that version. But uh, the next uh, round, we definitely want to keep increasing the number of people who are looking at it. And definitely, especially people who have uh, Macs, because that's an area that gets neglected a lot, uh, just because we don't have nearly as many people testing on that. Most of our active, we've, we've not done a very good job of supporting Mac. And uh, the main reason is that Almost all of us, we develop in Linux, and then we target Windows because we have to, because that's where most of the users are. And then Mac often falls to the side because it's just not as much bang for the buck, and uh, we none of us are developing on that. So, well, I think some some of our developers are using that, but I'm not, <laughs> and the guys doing the cores are not. So that's the the problem there. So if you're a Mac guy and you you want to help us support Mac better, we're very interested in that. Agreed. And that is? Mac guy or gal, I should say. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, everybody. Um, do you have any anything other closing? Um, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing your application and to develop folding at home and make it even stronger. Yeah, I just say thank you, everyone. Um, it's awesome having all this interest. You know, this it's been crazy, scary times. Um, you know, and it's good to see some good things coming out of it, and it's awesome to see everybody just jumping on board and wanting to do some good. And uh, yeah, we're really trying to support that and we really appreciate that. Great. Have a good continuous of your day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.